Matthew 13, verses 54 to 58. And in the Pew Bibles, that's page 868. The he in verse 54 is Jesus. He went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? And his sisters, aren't they all with us? So where does he get all these things? And they are offended by him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown and in his household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, I've moved around a fair bit. Uh, Last time I was chatting to my parents and we were talking about this topic. I think mum and dad had worked out that they'd moved nearly 50 times in their married life and I think I'm getting close to 25 or 30. So very hard for me to know what my hometown is. But I am told that coming back to your hometown can be a wonderful thing. The place where you've lived and grown up, coming back there can be a wonderful thing. Uh, The return to a hometown, the return to a home environment, the return to a home community, it can be good. A return to familiar sounds, smells and sights. A return to a familiar set of influences, a familiar set of memories, a set of familiar relationships. But I'm also told that sometimes it's not so good. Sometimes there's a danger in coming home. Sometimes the very things that are comfortable, the very things that have been established, the very things that have been set in stone in your community, they can all pose a danger. And the danger is this, that familiarity can breed contempt. That familiarity can breed contempt. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, We're only looking at four verses today. But it's a great reminder that in all of these words, you are speaking. Father, help us to listen to your word. Help us to understand your word and help your word to be applied to us so that we know Jesus as he is and are not scandalized by him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus comes home. Look there in verse 54. He went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue. We're not given a reason for his return home. His last interaction with his family wasn't what you'd call overwhelmingly positive, as some might like. But I can understand his desire to go home. Sometimes you just want to go back to something familiar, don't you? Sometimes you do want to go home. Sometimes you need to head home. When Jesus gets home, he does as he always does. Look there in verse 54. He began to teach them in their synagogue. Jesus teaches. That's what Jesus started off doing. If you remember back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, that was his business, the business of proclamation, of speaking to people the word of God. That's very important to grasp at this point. We're told nothing else of his time in his hometown except that he came home and taught. Do you notice we're not even told the content of his message? We're just told that he taught. Now, we should remember the content, shouldn't we? Because we're actually told that way back in the beginning, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. He hasn't changed his sermon. That's the key idea every week. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Turn around, because the right ruler of the universe has come. The reaction of the home crowd is very clear. Look again at verse 54. So they were astonished and said, how did this wisdom and these miracles come to him? Isn't this the carbonist's son? 
Isn't his mother called Mary, his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas and his sisters, aren't they all with us? So where does he get all these things and they were offended by him? Did you notice that their offence was prompted by his teaching? It wasn't prompted by anything else that he did. It was his teaching that provoked their response, as well as all the rumours that have travelled through the regions. And we're told that they're astonished. Put another way, they were overwhelmed. But don't be mistaken, uh, it's not good. The biographies of Jesus use that word to describe people who are either bewildered or offended, as we'll see in a moment. And the response of the home crowd, if you look carefully there, is structured in a very particular way. It's almost like it's got a rhythm. Uh, There's a bookend. How is this possible? How is this possible? When they're talking about what Jesus proclaims and practices. And then in the middle are a series of questions. Is this not? Is this not? And they all expect the answer. Oh, yes, of course it is. How is this possible? How is this possible? Is this not? And the teaching of Jesus is of such wisdom and magnitude that it provokes questioning. How is it possible that a man like this can speak like that? How is it possible that a man like this can do those kind of things? So what type of man was he? What type of man is that? And it's unpacked in those questions in the middle, isn't it? The family questions make that clear. He's the son of the carpenter. In this town, Jesus was known as Joseph's boy and Joseph was the carpenter. Uh, It would have been realistic to say that Jesus began his apprenticeship at 12, would have worked for at least 18 years as a carpenter. Have you ever thought about that? He worked for 18 years as a carpenter. People in that crowd would have seen his work. Some of them might even still be sitting at tables that he's built. There's rumours in the early church that people were still using ploughs made by Jesus. They know who this boy is. He's the carpenter's boy. He's the son of Mary. That's an important thing to remember. Now, there are no obvious allusions here to the birth of Jesus, but you know how small towns work, don't you? When a teenage fiancé gets pregnant, pregnant to the town carpenter, a small businessman. You know how the rumours work in a small town. So when they say, isn't this Mary's boy, you know what they're saying, don't you? He's the brother of James, Joseph, Simon and Judas. They know his brothers. If it was a town like this, I would say, well, our boys played footy with him and his brothers. The social circles mix, don't they, all over the place in a small country town. And do you know what? His sisters are still here with us. His family lives here. We know these people. What type of man is this? He's Joseph and Mary's boy, the carpenter, the brother of James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, And look, those girls over there, they're his sisters. Now, on one level, you could read that as just an obvious dismissal of his credentials as a teacher. After all, he's not from an established rabbinical family. His dad, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, they weren't ministers. They didn't go to Bible college. In fact, he's got no education qualifications whatsoever. He didn't go to the right school didn't go to the right Bible college, not even probably from the right family. And that would be dismissal enough, wouldn't it? But I think there's more going on here, more than just snobbery. I think the word used to describe their reaction in verse 57 is very important. Did you see it there, verse 57? And they were offended by him. And the words literally scandalised. It's where we get our word for scandal. You see, this is more than Jesus being inappropriate. This is scandalous. In fact, Matthew uses this word more than any other biographer of Jesus. It's used constantly in how Jesus speaks, 
and in how people respond to him. It's not just the stuff of the Daily Telegraph or the New Idea. It describes a hard-hearted rejection of Jesus and everything he stands for. A hard-hearted rejection of Jesus and everything he stands for. When Jesus proclaims and practices in his hometown, they completely reject him. They're scandalized by him. Their hearts are set against him. Why would they do that? Well, I think they reject him because they're familiar with him. And they're scandalized that someone like him would dare call them to repent, to say that they need a king. How dare a carpenter's boy say that? I mean, I babysat him. How dare he stand up and tell me how I should live? In this hometown, familiarity bred contempt, didn't it? And Jesus responds. I'm at point three on the outline. Look there in verse 57. But Jesus said to them, notice that he spoke it to the people in the synagogue. A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown and in his household. That's why we had the reading from Jeremiah, because that's how everyone treats people who come with God's revelation. That's how they treated all the prophets in the Old Testament. They were chosen by God to speak God's word to God's people, and they were universally reviled, rejected, persecuted. It's the same with God's son in his hometown, even in his own household. And so do you notice how Jesus responds there in verse 58? And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Now, don't misread that. It doesn't say he was incapable, does it? He just chose not to. Uh, if you're not going to accept my proclamation, don't expect my practice. He chooses not to. He's come home. He's taught in the gathering of God's people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, in his hometown. He's been completely rejected because they're scandalized by their familiarity and by his teaching. That's a rejection of him himself, everything about him, and so he walks. He goes. Now, really, it's not a hard incident to understand, is it? I'm sure when you looked at the Bible reading today, you thought four verses, we'll be out of here pretty quick, won't we? It's not hard to see how familiarity can breed contempt in Jesus' hometown at least, is it? I mean, they knew him, they watched him grow, he's part of their culture, they knew him as part of the fabric of their town, their relationships, his teaching offended them, scandalised them, but what are we to make of such an incident? Because we can understand it happening in Jesus' hometown, can't we? Well, I think that first reading that we had from John's Gospel reminds us that this is consistently how Jesus is received. John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world. The world was created through him, yet the world didn't recognise him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And we've seen that time and time again this year in this chunk of Matthew, haven't we? The opposition of Jesus was immense. He was rejected. He's called to repent, to recognise that we're in desperate need because our attempts at godness have failed. That's offensive, isn't it? He's called to repent, to suggest that I might need someone's help, someone's intervention. That's offensive. He's called to get ready for God's kingdom. That's an explicit rejection of my kingdom, isn't it? That's offensive. So really what happens in Jesus' hometown is what happens everywhere with Jesus. We understand that, don't we? He came to the world and the world rejected him. But I think there's also something here that's particularly sharp for those who are familiar with Jesus to the point of contempt and scandal and offence. And I know for me this week as I've read another book by a guy called Eugene Peterson that really has a go at the way that I listen and read and apply, this has really burrowed its way in through my ears. 
I, I think this level works on, on two, this, this, this area works on two levels. Uh, there are some in our world who are culturally familiar with Jesus, aren't they? They were raised in. They were baptised in. They went to Sunday school at. They attended this school. There's a familiarity there in a culture that can be blinding. It can be a familiarity that rejects Jesus because I know Jesus and he would never say anything like that, would he? There's a familiarity there that is scandalised when a baby in a manger dares to grow up and tell me that I need him. There's a familiarity there that is scandalised when a man who loves the world confronts the world and says, you desperately need me. But there's also a religious familiarity with Jesus, isn't there? This is the one that I fall into because I'm the paid professional Christian, aren't I? I know my Bible. I read my Bible. I even get paid to attend church and preach sermons. I serve in ministry. I'm a lay preacher, a lay leader. I'm on parish council. Even some of us can be scandalised by Jesus, can't we? That God give his own son a family tree that contains people of reputation and that's who God is interested in? That Jesus would dare state that anyone who is not wholeheartedly for him is against him? That Jesus might have the temerity to say that those who are made in the image of God are evil because they reject Jesus? That Jesus sat and ate with prostitutes and alcoholics and those who sleep under the bridge? That Jesus came to call people of different skin colour with jail records and illiteracy and broken families? That's scandalous, isn't it? Please, don't let your familiarity with Jesus let you be scandalised by him. Please, don't let your familiarity with Jesus, either cultural or religious, lead to you not hearing him, that he's come to give you rest, to restore you. Please don't let your familiarity with Jesus close your eyes and ears to his proclamation and practice in such a way that you cannot hear and experience his wonderful grace and love. The beavers remind us in the lion, the witch and the wardrobe that he's not a tame lion. He is as he is in his proclamation and practice. And if we listen to him, he will turn our world upside down and right way up. And it will be good. The best way to listen to Jesus is to read his word, isn't it? On your own, in company, and have it burrow through your ears and into your heart. And for your heart to be scandalised in such a way that you come to him for mercy. I think there's a third level here too. Because I think as Jesus finishes off this chunk and as we move into the next, he's actually preparing his disciples for the work that they will go out on. You see, we've been reminded that the family of Jesus is not biological, is it? It's made up of those who hear and obey the commands of their heavenly father because their elder brother did it for them, Jesus. It means that the disciples are actually going to stand with the prophets of old. Do you remember Matthew 5, 11 to 12? Blessed are you when you are persecuted because they've done that to my prophets always. It means that the disciples of Jesus will be blessed and approved by God because Those not scandalised by Jesus are approved by God. These disciples, all of God's people, have hometowns, don't they? They've got home households. 
places that are familiar and comfortable. And what happened to Jesus in his hometown will happen to them. We know that, don't we? We know that truth. What gives this person the right to say that? I've grown up with them. I know them. Please hear the encouragement here because there is immense encouragement here. Please be encouraged to proclaim and practice Jesus in your hometown, in your own household, just like he did. When we do that, we'll present the one person who can restore any person. And let me tell you, there will be scandal, but there will be salvation as people are restored. God willing, the scandal and salvation will be because of the proclamation of Jesus, the one who says, I come to give you rest. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, I know for me this week uh, there's been a serious burrowing through my ears and into my heart as I've been confronted by the familiarity that can breed contempt. Father, forgive us if we've been overly familiar with your son to the point where we don't hear his words or we're offended by them. Father, your son has given us eternal rest by his life, death and resurrection. Father, he's restored us and he's working in us. Father, help us to listen to him, to understand him and to proclaim him. And Father, through that, we pray that there will be great salvation brought in our households, in our hometowns. And Father, we pray that others will know him as we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Baxter, I haven't had a question from you for a while, mate. It's terrific. No, it's not. So Baxter's question is, the brother Judas, the same Judas that betrays him? No, it's not. Now, he was a brother of a different kind, wasn't he, in the sense that he presented an image that said that I obey our Heavenly Father. No, Judas Iscariot's an interesting man. Uh, I actually think he came from a small religious sect, the Sicarii, whose job was to provoke revolution by armed intervention. I think Judas Iscariot was impatient with Jesus that he wasn't kicking the Romans out fast enough and that's why he betrayed him and I suspect he betrayed Jesus in order to spark a revolution. I don't think he realised how big a revolution he sparked and it wasn't of the kind that he wanted.